Hello, good morning, my dear students. Good morning, good morning sir. sir. How are you? Fine, sir. Very well. Okay, please sit down. Today we shall discuss ecclesiastical characters dealt with by Chaucer in the general prologue to Canterbury Tales. There are seven ecclesiastical characters dealt with by Chaucer in the general plot to Canterbury Tales. These seven ecclesiastical characters are the prioress, the monk, the friar, the clerk of Oxford, the parson, the sumner, and the partner. Okay? You take them down somewhere. I repeat, the prioress, the monk, the friar, the clerk of Oxford, the parson, the sumner, and the partner. Is that fine? Yes. Okay. It may be pointed out at the very outset that Chaucer has given a very true and realistic picture of the ecclesiastical characters of his age. Now, my dear students, do you know who are ecclesiastical characters? Although we are discussing this, and uh, I haven't asked you, do you understand what does it mean, ecclesiastical characters? Yes? Well, it's not very clear? Okay, don't worry. Ecclesiastical characters are characters that are related to the church. Okay? They are, that are associated with the church life. Is, is that fine? Yes, sir. Characters who are related to the church are called as ecclesiastical characters. And as I told you in the beginning that there are seven ecclesiastical characters in the general prologue to Canterbury Tales. Now, on the one hand, Chaucer satirizes the corrupt and worldly minded clergies and on the other hand he appreciates the good characters and presents an ideal picture of theirs. So there are seven ecclesiastical characters out of these seven five are correct and two are good ones. So what does Chaucer do? Chaucer criticizes the corrupt clergyman and he appreciates the good characters. Well, the only ecclesiastical characters whom Chaucer admires and whom we admire also are the clerk of Oxford and the parson for whom the author has nothing but praise. The other characters belonging to the church are ridiculed and satirized. Chaucer exposes the follies, the absurdities, the monetary greed, the hypocrisy and on the whole the irreligious nature of these men of religion. Indeed, we feel greatly depressed and dismayed by the spectacle of these clergymen who are not only most worldly minded but also dishonest, immoral and corrupt. So, here not only in Chaucer's age, even in our age we find that men of religion are not very genuine, true. They are corrupt. So, in fact, you know, it's just the same. Means the way they were in the 14th century or even in earlier centuries, we, we notice that they are just the same even in the present century. Well, my dear students, it is the abundance of humor in the portrayal of these persons that relieves the depression and dissolves it in laughter. Well, you know, if you wish, we may discuss a separate question also on Chaucer's humor. Because Chaucer's humor uh, is also very important. It is as important as his irony is, as his tongue-in-cheek expressions are, which he uses for his clergymen. When we consider that a large number of the men of religion all over the world, even today, is no better than it was in Chaucer's time, we are driven to the conclusion that human nature has not changed much since then. 
and that religion has through the centuries served largely as a cloak for the nefarious activities of unscrupulous people who resort to the religious profession to promote their own selfish ends. Let us now discuss these seven ecclesiastical characters individually. I am repeatedly telling you that there are seven ecclesiastical characters. Remember them. Okay? Now, let us discuss them individually. Prioress. The prioress comes first. A study of the conditions prevailing in Chaucer's time would show that Chaucer created this prioress straight from his own world. However, she corresponds to the character of palaces as they were in the 14th century. True to type, this palace is, this palace is essentially well-bred. What do you understand by well-bred? Well-bred is? Well-off. Well-off, very nice. Well-off, effluent. Hmm? Okay. So, she is true to type because she represents her class. She repents the church life and she is also individualized. What do you understand by saying that a character is individualized? That means besides being a typical character, that means besides having the characteristics which are representative of his or her class, he or she has some individual characteristics as well. Okay? Now, for example, she has a romantic name. What name she has? Eglantine. Eglantine. She has a romantic name, Eglantine. Having probably led a life of refinement in her early years, she indulges in certain vanities, which of course belong either wholly or in part to many nuns of Chaucer's time. A prowess was not expected to swear at all, but but Eglantine swears by Saint Law. Okay, by Saint Law, remember the name. She swears by Saint Law, the seventh century courtier turned saint. So I repeat, she swears. By whose name does she swear? Saint Law. Saint Law. And who was Saint Law? The 14th century courtier turned saint. Right. Eglantine is depicted as having exaggeratedly good table manners because as Chaucer says, she always takes pains to imitate the manners of court life. You know, court life happened to be the ideal life. Means they were, you know, aristocratic people. Um, they, um, they were elegant and they were very graceful in their gestures, in their behavior, in their deportment. And you know, like it was a fashion to imitate their style, their way of life. And she would also do the same, as Chaucer points us, points us out. She speaks fluent French. Now, speaking uh, fluent French is again a uh, individual characteristic. Okay, it is an individual characteristic because all palaces were not good at French. But she speaks fluent French. And although it is not Parisian French, Parisian French is French which is spoken in Paris. It is still French and hence aristocratic. You know, like in India, for example, if you know Hindi and besides Hindi, you know Urdu and uh, Sanskrit also, you know, that gives you an added quality that enhances your personality. And this was true with the English man as well. If they knew, uh, say, uh, other languages, especially French, they were considered aristocratic. Means that they spoke English, and if they spoke French too fluently, then they were considered aristocratic. So uh, that way we may call uh, Taurus, what is the name? Eglantine, to be an aristocratic lady. Eglantine is not always careful about obeying the rules of her position. For example, for example, nuns were forbidden to go on pilgrimages by the 14th century bishops. Yet they frequently did. And Eglantine is among 
Joseph Pilgrim. Nuns were also forbidden to keep pets of any kind, yet Eglintine possesses little dogs and she lavishes affection and care upon them, even feeding them with meat and expensive bread. Okay, this again is an individual characteristics. So, you know, uh, say after the lecture, you can also make a note of the typical characteristics and the individual characteristics. So, you would know like what are the typical characteristics of Eglantine, the palace, and what are the individual characteristics. This way you can understand a character better. Sometimes, you know, you, if, if you get, uh, say, a um, question like this, write a short sketch of uh, the palace. Then you will be able to write, means you will be in a position to write a nice character sketch if you make a note of her typical as well as individual characteristics. Now, let's move further. Eglantine is personally vain. Vain. What does it mean? Vain. V a i n. Vain. Yes. Means uh, she is very pompous. She is very pompous. Yes, she is very pompous. She is very showy. She is very arrogant. She is very proud. Good. So Eglantine is personally vain. Her appearance is important to her, for she displays too much of her broad forehead to the world, and she cannot hide her love for jewelry. Now you see in India, in, like you know about uh, some nuns. Can you, can you name one or two, if you remember? Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa, very nice. This is what I was expecting. Now, Mother Teresa, did she also love jewelry and like other things? No. No, she didn't. She, she, she led a very simple life. So, they, they ought to lead a simple life. Whereas, our Eglantine doesn't lead a simple life. She is very pompous, very vain. She shows her broad forehead to the world. You know, showing broad forehead, what does it signify? It signifies that she was very affluent. She was very well off. And she wanted the world to notice this. And she cannot hide her love for jewelry also. Her rosary is too elaborate for none. And the brooch she wears, bearing an ambiguous motto. Ambiguous. What does ambiguous mean? Having two meanings. Having two meanings. Okay. Or when the meaning is not clear. Good. So she wears a brooch wearing an ambiguous motto. Remember this motto, okay? And you just take it down. Amor vincit omnia. Amor vincit omnia. A M O R. Amor vincit. V I N C I T. Vincit omnia. O M N I A. Amor vincit in omnia. What does it mean? Love conquers all. Very good. Love conquers all. Now, love conquers all. This is what she wears. This brooch, and it now it has. Now this is this is a uh, this is an ambiguous expression. Love conquers all. Question arises: sacred or profane love? Profane love means mundane love. Should not be worn by a nun. Although Chaucer does criticize the Paris for her vanities and for her disregard of the rules. However, the blame is extremely mild. You know, Chaucer, uh, when he uh, when he criticizes uh, his ecclesiastical characters, his uh, criticism is very mild. It's very genial. It's not pungent. The poet makes her quite charming. Though her graceful femininity may not be tolerated by those who are strictly religious. You know, Chaucer is very mild in a satire, but you know, if we like uh, see her by the yardstick of other uh, other uh, clergymen, say bishops or priests and all, they wouldn't find her uh, a nice character. Okay, they wouldn't find fault with her because she was too worldly. So th this is our. Uh,